so thank you everyone for attending this this call here with uh, Stefan. Um, we're or, I'm very excited to have him here um, to talk about linked data and uh, his new module, the RDF indexer, and and also just talk about how ESIP can be you know just sort of a, a source for RDF and. Um, yeah, usages of linked data and, and just sort of the use cases for, for that and, and his model. So uh, I'll turn this over to Stefan, and then, you know, maybe we'll do a little questions and answers at the end there. Or Stefan, just if it makes more sense to do it during your talk, that's fine, uh, too. And then uh, we'll wrap up with just, uh, you know, uh, some notes from Bruce about uh, the Drupal Lab uh, for the ESIP meeting next month. So, uh, Stefan, I'll, I'll mute myself and turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so, I think I'll, I'll take maybe half an hour for a slide, press uh, a demo at the end. So, uh, I'm going to present uh, an update on uh, what's available to in Group 7 to, to use the semantic web and link data. So, <coughs> my name is Stefan Kosket, and um, I, some people know me as core on Drupal.org. I've been with Drupal for seven years. Um, I work um, at, at Acquia. Uh, I have a and provide hosting and support and all the services around Drupal. And uh, I also work for Mine Informatics uh, out, of, out of MGH here in Boston, where I, I build um, Drupal sites for, for the group, and we our, our goal is to build online communities around uh, biomedical communities. So uh, I'm also involved with the RDF work that's uh, present in Drupal 7. Uh, I also, I'm also a member of the Drupal security team. I co-authored the uh, definitive guide to Drupal 7. I, I, I co-maintain several concrete modules uh, relating to RDF and Sparkle and, and other semantic web technologies. I also happen to be a member of the RDFA working group at the Berlin Script. So uh, first I'm going to present uh, the, quickly the semantic web. I'm sure many of you know what it is. Uh, I'll just highlight the, the key aspects that I, that I like about it and that, that um, drove me to, to researching it and using it more. So the web today is uh, very fragmented. We have lots of communities, lots of data silos that we use every day and it, it, it's hard to make these uh, data silos communicate with each other. So we have our data scattered all around in uh, several islands. And how do we make this data uh, connect to each other? And how can we use all of this data together? So there's a growing amount of information on, online. Uh, people publish blog posts. Uh, news, leave comments, and lots of platforms like Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, and so it, it's it's an ongoing, um, growing process where more and more data ends up online. So there, there's also a vast amount of devices out there that are used to push data online, and um, it, it's uh, increasing, uh, and we need to. Uh, to do something about how, how can we leverage this data. So machines can help us, but uh, on the web, what machines see generally is HTML with links, so mostly plain text with links, and sometimes they try to they manage to extract some some more information from there, but it's uh, it's ambiguous and it's, it's not clear what how machines um, see our data. So with this growing 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 amount of information, how can we help machine uh, do a better job of uh, helping us searching through the information. So the vision of the semantic web, uh, it's something that Tim Bermersley came up with. Um, it's uh, transitioning towards uh, a giant global graph. So the web, as we know today, is a form of, form of content plus links, uh, HTML content plus hyper, hyperlinks. And we want to add some relationships to these uh, these pages and more descriptions inside these pages, inside these documents, to build this giant global graph. 
Um, and then the ultimate goal is to make the web, the symmetric web, a universal medium for data uh, and knowledge exchange. So you can see this as an evolution. On the bottom left corner, we started with computers and then TCP IP. And slowly we're moving from documents to uh, concepts and entities as part of a graph. And, and RDF is uh, in the, the standard that you can use to do that, to describe this information. And then there's the concept of the one machine where everything is connected, uh, all the devices are connected, and now they share data, they push data around. So the key to achieve this is uh, to agree on standards, and WMS3C is uh, the main uh, body for creating standards for the web. And then also opening data or sharing data, whatever data you can share, is also a, a great initiative. So let's look at the, let's look at link data now. So uh, many people have have uh, been aware of this semantic web uh, initiative for a long time, and they started publishing data. And this initiative came out a few years back, uh, where there were more and more data sets linking to each other and um, some folks decided to to uh, list all of the da these data sets and that begin to link open data cloud. So you can find lots of information there. Um, these databases are scattered around the web, but you can see here uh, it, they contain a lot of uh, all sorts of uh, information about you know from coming from government or pub publications, uh, life science, etc. And uh, many Many organizations are providing uh, open data uh, at the moment, uh, like the BBC and uh, um, governments from the US and the UK. DBTDI is also another well-known, it's a Wikipedia extraction. And then there's, uh, the, there are two interesting projects uh, coming out, which I think will, uh, will, will grow uh, much larger than the others. Uh, Wikidata is kind of the successor to DBPDA. It's a Wikimedia Foundation initiative to express all the data, or at least the, the info boxes data and the, the links across pages from Wikipedia uh, in, in a structured data database and to drive Wikipedia, Wikipedia's content from that centralized Wikidata uh, database. And that's a, that's a project uh, founded by Google and others, so uh, there's lots of money behind and it's, uh, I think it's a promising project. And Freebase, um, a similar project. Uh, it's, it's also a knowledge base. Um, he started as a, as a separate company and it was bought by Google a few years back. And that's what's driving the knowledge graph at the moment, um, Google's knowledge graph. So rich snippets, um, a quick, quick reminder for those who don't know. Um, so rich snippets are these uh, enriched search results you can see when you do a search online uh, when there are more elements than just uh, the, the strings that uh, matching your keywords. So um, the goal here is to present more um, interesting and informative results to the users so the users don't have to go and browse the entire web to find what they're looking for. So slowly search engines are trying to get smarter and ultimately they're trying to be able to answer your question um, to guess what you want and answer the question right away without uh, you having to read um, several web pages to find the information you're looking for. So this is all done via structured data that is found in HTML of your site. And so search engines are very keen on collecting this structured data and they use that for also for building their knowledge graph. And it's also important to know that most search engines only index HTML as far as we know. So uh, that's why it's important to, to consider having searches in HTML. And, and that's something that Drupal can help with. Um, schema.org, very briefly, that's this initiative from the search engines. Again, that's directly related to structured data in HTML. Um, it has uh, hundreds of types and hundreds of properties. Um, this is a, a big picture view of all the types. And so if you go to a type, you can see all the properties and you can use that to annotate your content. 
Um, there is a schema.org module for Drupal, uh, and it basically allows you to annotate e each of your component types and each of your fields and map them to a type from schema.org or a property for sch from schema.org. This is how the UI looks like. This is when you're editing a content type, this is what you see. You can choose what, what type from schema.org you want to map to your content type. And same for the fields. This is all embedded in the administrative UI. Uh, and at the bottom of each field, you can specify the property from schema.org that, that corresponds to this field. And this is the, the type of search results you can get today uh, that, that Drupal is capable of building and that Google can uh, retrieve and uh, present. And this is the, the URL for, for the module that you can download for free from, from, uh, from Drupal.org. Um, okay, so now let's look quickly at the architecture that, that is used uh, for modeling RDF in Drupal 7. So first, first thing to know is that uh, there is no fixed data structure in Drupal. It, it's very much user-driven because site administrators can build their data model the way, the way they want. So they can typically they create several content types, and then they add fields to these content types, and then they create nodes. Uh, they create nodes uh, that basically instantiate a given content type and have all the fields that, that were set up for this content type. And when we export in RDF, we map each of these concepts to an RDF concept. So concept types will become an RDF class, fields become an RDF property, and nodes become uh, a resource in RDF. So you have access to the same UI. There's no change. Um, this is all the information that we that we use for building the RDF. And so when you this is the node. Um, and you can see all the fields being displayed. Um, that again, the display is something that you can customize. The layout of your page is something you can customize. But um, essentially, you can you can um, get structured data uh, out of your database um, into into HTML. So the there's an RDF mapping API in Drupal 7. Um, so default, by default, it comes with several mappings from, uh, from Pof, Shock, Dublin Core, and SCOS. And um, these mappings are uh, output in RDFA inside the HTML. Um, but you can change these mappings to include other vocabularies, like schema.org or, or any custom vocabulary. And you can do that using uh, contributed modules. This is the default mappings that come in Drupal 7 um, out of the box, but you, then you can change these. Um, now, the core itself is, is, has some limitations that are good to know. Um, so because we released Drupal 7 six months before schema.org was, was released, we, we don't have any schema.org mappings in, out of the box, although this is, um, this is uh, planned to be fixed for Drupal 8. There's also no UI or setting the mappings in core, uh, although there are some in, in contrib. And only the core field that supported uh, out of the box. Um, but uh, some of the contrib fields, like more complex contrib fields like address field and site store, are not yet supported. Um, there's also no native support for views and panels, but this place suite 2.0 um, is, is uh, known to work. So uh, a lot of the issues above can be fixed uh, by downloading, downloading contributing modules. And, and like I said, uh, we're using this for improving the, the, the RDF uh, experience in Drupal 8. So here is a, a bunch of modules uh, that you can download to improve the RDF uh, of your site. RDF extension, extensions is, is a module to have all the formats as output, like RDF XML or Turtle. And, there's also a mapping UI as part of this module. RDF indexer is kind of the, the highlight of, of this presentation, and I will go, go into details later. 
uh, it provides uh, a way to have a Sparkle endpoint over your data. Sparkle views is uh, the other way around. Display data from a remote Sparkle endpoint into your Drupal site. And JSONLE is a newer module um, that, that's come on exposing uh, data, sterilizing RDF as JSONLE, uh, which is a new standard, not, not yet um, finished, almost finished as part of the RDF uh, working group. So, um, so this module is available. And worth no noting also is features. Um, it, it's good. Good module to use if you're doing lots of uh, deployment, so you can keep your configuration and all your mappings into code. Um, you don't have to keep them in the database. So that's um, also a good thing to use. Best practice. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, Drupal and Sparkle. So this is the architecture that we use. Um, so for those of you, first of all, Sparkle is, uh, you may not be familiar with Sparkle, it's um, the query language that uh, that we use for querying RDF data, or for querying triple data. So it's equivalent to SQL for relation database. And um, Sparkle is uh, both uh, a language, a query language, it's also a protocol for retrieving results. And the way this works in Drupal is that because Drupal works on a relational database, like like I'm um, like I'm um, showing here in the main in the center at the center of this diagram, uh, all the data at least until Drupal 7, uh, all the data is contained in this uh, relational database. So obviously we can't we don't we don't provide uh, a Spark endpoint over this database. Um, so the same way we have um, solar backend for search, and that's a separate module. I'm not going to go you know, go into details today, but it's just to give you a similar approach. So the solar module is for uh, improved and faster full text search and faceted search. The way solar works is that uh, Drupal will send uh, its data as uh, JSON into the solar backend. The solar backend will index this data. and can answer search requests from the Drupal site later on. So what's important here is the fact that Drupal will rely on a separate backend for specialized jobs, such as full text search. And for full text search, we rely on Solar. Now for graph search, for Sparkle queries, we rely on the, also on a specific backend called an RDF store or a Tripper store. And Similarly, we, we send data to that, trip, to that Tripper store, and that Tripper store also exposes uh, the data via a Sparkle endpoint. So when we send Sparkle queries, we are executing these queries in, against the, the RDF store, which is optimized for, for answering these queries. So um, I've got the URL of the, of the module. It's called RDF Indexer. And I also wrote some documentation explaining how to set it up. So once you've installed RDF index, Indexer, you get, um, you, depending on which RDF store you're using, and again, I forgot to mention here, the RDF store that you use um, can be any kind of uh, any, any kind of store. Um, right now, I'm using R2 for for this presentation. That's the only one that that has been integrated with Drupal, although. I'm hoping we'll have more later on, but um, so now it's just R2, but think of it as just a, a black box, and it could be any kind of store that, that can accept RDF data. So if you go to that store, uh, and if you set up the store to publish a Sparkle endpoint, you can go to the Sparkle endpoint URL, and you can see a, a form where you can enter your Sparkle queries. And this form will, will vary depending on which Backend you're using, this is a uh, uh, snapshot. This is uh, the R2 um, Sparkle endpoint. Um, so there's a story to this uh, Sparkle endpoint module. So uh, when I when I was doing my um, 
master's degree, I, I wrote the first implementation of the Spark Run Point module um, that was four years ago. And um, you know, over time, it was a first prototype. Uh, and over time, I realized it, it didn't scale. And we had to redo, redo a lot of the things that were already present in Drift. So um, I decided to rewrite the Spark Run Point module. So the old Spark Run Point Spark Run Point module should not be used anymore. It was part of the Sparkle project. Um, you should no longer use that if you're already using it, but unless you really need it for, for some other module that's, that it that it includes. But you should instead use the RDF indexer. Yeah. There's a background noise there. Yeah. What? Someone could. I'm. If someone could um, mute, please. Okay. Um, so RDF indexer is the module to use. There's some documentation to set it up. In terms of functionalities and in terms of you know, what, what's different from the old Spark Run point is that we're now using the Select API to, uh, to um, so that we don't have to reinvent a lot of the fun the features that Search API provides. For example, Search API can track all entities that need to be indexed. Uh, it provides workflows for defining, you know, find, you can define uh, what what type of entities you want to index if you just want to index a particular function type or if you want to index just the comments, you can do that. It also has integration with Drush, so you can easily, you know, clear an index and re-index everything with the with the command line. It also manages the cron, so cron is used to keep track or to keep the index up to date with the with the real data from Drupal. And Search API is also uh, object oriented, um, so it, it provides a service class and it's very handy for writing plugins that that will support other stores. Um, so we're taking full advantage here of Search API. And the RDF indexer and the, the ARC2 module that 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 is present on, on, on Crypto.org both have integration with features. So that means you can export all of your configuration, all of your server and, and indexes from this from the RDF indexer into a feature into codes. And you can share that or deploy that to your staging or live environment very easily. So here is an example of a um, Sparkle query that you can run. Uh, this is uh, a query to get a list of tags um, ordered by popularity, uh, in a sense, uh, or by, by comments. So it, it shows the, the most popular tags that have received the most comments from, from uh, uh, um, the articles that I wrote on my blog. So if you go to OpenSpring.net slash Sparkle, and if you try this Sparkle query, uh, and if you select HTML on the right-hand side, you will um, you will get the, the results that you see in the right here. Um, so I might, um, OK, so this is the end of, of, of my slide. Um, I just wanted to, to tell you how to get involved. If you want to subscribe to we, to our group, we have a, a semantic web group where we will uh, keep people updated on the progress we are making for for RDF and semantic web in Drupal. You can also uh, chat on uh, Drupal-RDF on RC. And each module has a uh, uh, Queue, a queue system for bugs and support questions on Drupal.org. So if you go to, say, the RDF indexer module, you will see on the right, on the right sidebar, uh, there are links to access the, um, uh, the issue queue, where you can find uh, all the all the bugs that we that we know about. Um, and uh, this is just a, a final slide to thank you for listening. Um, I do have a demo coming up, but these are just my information details for uh, contacting me there. 
And so uh, we, I could take a few questions now. Um, is there any, any question about uh, RDS in general in Drupal? What I switch to my demo? I don't know if you have any questions. It's, and it's fine if we, we can also keep the, the questions for the, for the end uh, after the demo. So, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this is in background noise again. Uh, yeah, that's okay. one of the call-in users has a uh, so, noise. Can... So I'm going to start from scratch. So I have. Um, I have a, uh, I'm going to install Drupal 7 on my local machine uh, from scratch. And just to show you a few of the features that the RDF index remote can provide. So I've installed, I've installed Drupal. And now uh, using Drush, I'm going to uh, install all the modules, modules that I need. So Sparkle Endpoint Demo is actually a feature that has all of the other, all of the dependencies, uh, part of, part of it. Uh, so it is Arc2 store. This is uh, the Arc2 integration, and then REF indexer, and all the dependencies to make this work. And this feature also includes um, all the the search API, RDF indexer settings already set up. And then I'm going to log in. Okay, so I'm logged in into my my site, and the first thing I'll do this is a, this is an empty site, so I'm going to create content. Is it is it fast enough? Can or am I am I driving my browser too fast? I'm not sure if there's is a lag here, or oh that looks good. Looks good. Okay, so I'm just going to create um an, a random article. Okay. And this, is this article. Okay. And now I can go to configuration. First of all, I have um, I heard the I have the Arc2 store set up. So Arc2 uh, works or can work on the same uh, database as my Drupal site. And I have set up this uh, this Arc2 store. On my Drupal site, and um, I have the Sparkle endpoint enabled. This is the path where my Sparkle endpoint is accessible. These are all the Sparkle endpoint features, and uh, there are all the settings here. So you can also have a read API key. You can also enable the write operations if you want, or the public to to write to your Sparkle endpoint. So this is all uh, this is all uh, set up and. Now I can show you the RDF indexer interface. So uh, RDF indexer doesn't really have an interface of, of its own. It, it's using the search API interface. And here you can see the search API server uh, using the Arc2 store. And then um, this is the, the RDF index where uh, the RDF index that's managing my, my indexing. So. I only have one node on my site, and you can see it here. Um, it's saying that it needs to be indexed, so I can just click on Index now. It's, it's done. So now, if I go to my my Sparkle endpoint, and if I ask to say what's what's in it, this is um this is my node that's um, available. In the Spark endpoint, this is the title that I that I just entered. Now, if I go back to the node and if I add some tags, um, like this, and if I save that, now if I go back here, it's it's saying again that I need to reindex. So you don't you don't have to always go back. Um, to this interface. Uh, in fact, you can just use cron. So if, if cron is running on your site and it's actually recommended to 
have it running um, every every few minutes, your um, Sparkle endpoint will be, will be kept up to date with your data. So now if I um, reload this page, you can see that there are more there are new triples that got added here. And um, in particular, so we have the DC subject linking to uh, term one, two, and three. These are the, the new tags I just added here. And so uh, this is how the RDF index works. It keeps, it keeps your uh, RDF store in sync, and therefore your Sparkle endpoint also, also is kept in sync. Now, I want to show you. Um, I'm going to enable the data generate module, and I want to uh, go ahead and create uh, a few hundreds of nodes, 300 of articles, and um, I just want to show you that uh, the indexing is is uh, is a seamless. So. If I reload this page now, it's telling me that um, only one item is indexed, and there are 301 items total. So uh, I need to index all of the nodes that that, got, that just got created. So if I click on index now, um, this is going to take a few seconds, but all of the nodes that I just generated will now be present here. So you look at the, the bar here, it's pretty big, and I've got maybe 10 triples in my background time. If I reload this, uh, I'll suddenly have many more. So this is uh, the amount of triples we have here. And if I if I write a query to count, how many triples I have? Yeah, I've got 2,900 triples. Um, so this is roughly uh, from these 300 nodes, we have almost 3,000 tri triples, so it's an average of 10 triples per node. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is basically what I want to show, um, and I can also show you the um, the other uh, example I had here. Um, Sparkle query. Sparkle query on my blog that returns all the tags and the number of replies that all the articles tagged with this term have had have received. So that's that, that's it for the demos. Well, wow. thank you questions. Um, okay, so thanks, Stefan. Sure. Um, I have a question about uh, about the, s the speed of this. Is this uh, have, have you and, and scaling? Have you, uh, you 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 said that at some point your original uh, module had some scaling issues, and and how have you addressed those? Um, so. Uh, I've addressed those simply by switching to the search API, and the search API takes takes care of that um, for me, basically. It, it's um yeah, so it's a pretty. I think it's just basically what, what a lot of modules do, and best practice is to try to reuse other modules or other APIs as as a as foundation. So, search API is a, is a I think it's a good API for managing. Any kind of search indexing, even though we we don't so we don't use um, the RDF indexer for search. The search happens on the RDF backend, not uh, not in Drupal like most search API uh, modules would would do. So we only use I'd say we might only use like half of the functionalities of search API, but at the same time it it saves. It saves me a lot of code. I don't have to write all of the functionality of Search API 
um, shift switch. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Uh, any other great. questions? Yeah. Stefan, I just had a quick question. Well, I guess there's there's two questions. One is, uh, what, what's the likelihood that we might be able to leverage this RDF indexer module um, to populate external triple stores? Um, and if that's not possible, um, you know, how can we help contribute or, you know, uh, help in that effort to uh, provide that functionality? Do you, have, do you already have a, a triple store backend in mind? Uh, yeah, like a virtuoso open source. Yeah, uh, right. So um, you could write a plugin for for RDF indexer. Um, so the way the way it works, the way it's architectured is that um, RDF indexer uh, sits on top of Search API using a, a OOP approach. So your plugin would sit on top of uh, RDF indexer and would, would implement um, uh, a, a class and uh, would connect to the Virtuoso backend. So as long as your Virtuoso backend has a, 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 a way to receive data, either through uh, Sparkle 1.1 one, one update or through other means, um, that should work. OK. Great. Thank you. And, and to give you an idea, I mean, so far on the on the real sites, I've um, I've been uh, indexing about uh, eight thousand uh, nodes, I, I actually entities, because uh, the site that, that I'm referring to uh, has also field field collections. So field collections and nodes uh, added uh, came up to about 8,000, and uh, and that represented about 80,000 triples in Octo. Um, so I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it could go, go higher than that. The previous uh, Sparkle endpoint module, as far as I recall, was. Um, starting to choke at about 3,000 nodes, but that's that's problem solved now. Great. How many nodes um, would you start with? Um, so I have a metadata database that has about half a million. And okay, that'd be in this case. <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. So, uh, yeah, I'm really curious to uh, to try this out and and uh, see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So I did some benchmark, and so the speed of indexing depends a lot on your uh, RDF backend. Okay. So it, it depends how fast it is at ingesting this data, uh, basically because the, the RDF indexer will send the data. And uh, wait for it to, or wait for the backend to, to respond whether it got the data or not. Uh, Arc2 is not the most efficient one. Um, I just use it because it's easy to set up. But I'm sure Virtuoso would be faster than that. Um, so to index this uh, this 8,000 node, it took me about eight minutes with Arc2, and that's the one that Arc2 is using the same database as my Drupal site. So there's room for, for improvement here. Um, okay. And I did uh, another benchmark where I was uh, indexing the data, except I wasn't sending it to Arc2, and it took uh, about two minutes for 8,000 nodes. So this is just the time it takes to load the node, uh, but that's not counting the time that it would take to send the data to the backend. And so depending on how fast the backend is, it could take, um, you know, down to two minutes for for eight thousand nodes if if it's fast. Great. And, and these were pretty complex uh, entities, or for some of them at least, and they were not uh, small small entities. Some of them had um, one or two dozens of fields. Wow. 
Stefan, uh, so I think this ESUP community here has, uh, and I think Bruce mentioned this in his email, that we've got a ton of content uh, at our fingertips here in, in this various Asundria projects that we work on. Um, in what ways can we sort of engage in the semantic web community, or what would be the good channels for us to, I don't know, um, engage in this community and then just figure out how we can collaborate or where our data sets might make sense to to link to each other. Do yeah. you have any advice on that topic? Right. So there are several, several things there. Um, first of all, there's the link data aspect of it. So, and that's something I didn't, didn't really uh, cover in this presentation, but um, what you can do, uh, what you can do well with Drupal right now is publishing uh, RDF data from your Drupal site, but it, your Drupal site might not link to external data sets. Uh, I, I don't know your, your use case, but out of the box, obviously out of the box, a new Drupal site uh, does not know where to link its content to or how to, how to find other uh, uh, resources from the say the linked the the the, the linked uh, open data cloud. So there is room here for uh, building modules that would that would help to um, to link your your content to other data sets because that's a that's first uh, condition for being so called um, a linked data. Um, so it, you could it could just be as it, it could be a manual process or it could be automated. So there is a there is a library that can help you if you're interested in uh, automating the. Um, I'm gonna start sharing again. Sorry. Uh, there is a, a library called Apache Scandal that can help you uh, find uh, extracting entities from your content. So. Uh, Apache Standball will take as input some a blurb of text, and we'll try to match the exact uh, entities from it based on some data set that it that it knows about. So if you're if you want to match again a DBpedia, you can set up uh, Standball with a DBpedia uh, data set, and you can run the semantic engine. Uh, content enhancement service to extract oops, I'm show you demo here, to to extract uh, entities from your text. So let me show you an example here. This is a uh, RDF ACE. It's a uh, it's a tiny MC plugin. And the way it works is it's going to read your your content. Um, the demo. So as you type as you author content, um, it can detect the entity. So this is running the entity extraction engine, and it, it found, for example, Leipzig, uh, uh, Frankfurt as a place, uh, Germany, and uh, Christian Gellert as a person. So, and these, these are coming, uh, these entities are linked to DBpedia in this instance, um, but the service, the service that's running this WYSIWYG interface could also accept any kind of text uh, via, via its RESTful API. So uh, this is just uh, one, one thing. You can also have a field. Uh, you can also set up a field um, that you that you into which you paste your rights from other data sets. That would be a manual process, uh, a bit, you know, a bit maybe more, more cumbersome, but it would work. So to to continue. Answering your question, um, then you we're asking about how how can you get involved. So there are two communities at play here. The first one is 
the, the Drupal community, uh, the Drupal semantic web community, where um, because you're using Drupal, it's, it's, uh, you, you kind of have to have the right modules in place on your Drupal site to expose the data. So I, I presented some of these modules. And, and for example, you said you're interested in uh, working on the Virtuoso plugin. Right. So you, uh, you can join, I think the best um, one place to what is the RDF indexer issue queue. So this is the project. And as I was saying earlier on the right, bar, on the right side bar, we have links here um, to the issue queue. So this is going to show you all the known, known bugs and other support requests that people have filed. And you can, you can come here and create a new issue. And you can, um, you can say, for example, hey, I'm interested in uh, having this RDF, for, RDF indexer module working with, with virtual. So you could create you know, an issue and how can we make this work with virtual. And you can explain here your motivations and, and, and everything. And then we can, we can have a discussion. Uh, discussions, right. look, uh, discussions look like this. So you know, there's, a, there's an initial post, and then there are comments. Uh, and we can, we can go from there. Um, if, you're, if you're not sure where to, where to post your question, um, you can go to the semantic web group. This is more for generic questions. Um, if you have specific bugs, it's best to go into the group. But if you have more general questions about you know, the future of you know, something that doesn't exist maybe in Drupal, yeah. you, can, you can ask them there. And uh, same, same, um, same process. We're going to have uh, discussions um, following up your, your post. And um, that's, how, that's how we work. Um, so this is for the Drupal community. And then the second community that you're most likely interested in is the, 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 linked, the linked data community in general, right? Right. Uh, once you once your data is available, once your data is linked to Freebase or Wikidata or Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia um, you want to tell the world that you that you're sharing the data set. So for that, I would recommend um, uh, public LD, the public free C mailing list, and I'm sure you, you might be subscri subscribed already. Um, so you can go to this page. Is that here? Everyone? I'm not sure if that works. Um, this is uh, this is where you can subscribe, and, and people will announce their data sets. There is also um, you can go to the. LOD Cloud site, which uh, will tell you how to add, how to get your your data set added to this uh, large existing uh, cloud of, of data sets, which is actually outdated. This is from two years ago, and it's gotten so big now that it's hard to manage the building. Um, so I'm not sure how it looks right now, but. Um, and here there's a there's a FAQ and you can uh, there there it is. Um, it tells you how to add your data set into the diagram. So Great. Another link. And I this link is part of my slides. I think I have it in in one of the slides where I talk about the LED cell. Um, and then uh, there's also. Um, it's also CCAN. Um, where um, depending on you know which community you're interested in, um, you could uh, you could go there and find a rep um, a CCAN repository that would support to do that. So if it's uh, government related uh, or, or science related, you can you can find it there. You can promote it. Oh,
Oh, thank you. And and uh, Stefan, this is Bruce. Uh, if we can get your slides, uh, uh, we'll put them up on the uh, ESIP uh, Drupal uh, discussion page on the on the. Uh, I can um, I can share them on SlideShare if you like. Yeah. Okay. That That's fine. Okay. Um, and we're also recording this, so we'll put this up as a uh, as a YouTube video. It's all right with you, Stefan. Sure. All right. Any more questions for Stefan? I have one uh, question. Can you give like a quick description of how the Sparkle Views module works to do queries to a, another Sparkle endpoint um, instead um, of yeah? I don't have it. Like, I, I don't have it set up, um, but I can just describe to you how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so from um, from a user perspective, basically you have to register a remote Sparkle endpoint where your data is coming from, uh -huh. and then and then on your site um, you create a view, which which will be of a specific Sparkle Sparkle views um, type, and so there's there's, a, there's quite some setup involved in between where you have to register each field um, that you want to use in your final view. You have to register each field into uh, an entity type that will serve as a. So there won't be any uh, any uh, entity created, but it will just serve as a temporary entity for uh, writing the Sparkle query and presenting or materializing the entity for um, so that views can believe that the entity exists somewhere. Um, so there's a there's quite a setup involved. Like uh, you need to set up click you know several clicks and um to, to get there. But uh what you will get in the end is uh a view, like a table view of uh of resources coming from the from the remote spark on point. And um I don't have anything set up right now but um I've used it a few times and uh for, for demo purposes and it's um it's uh it's working pretty well. There are some there are some bugs here and there but it's um Otherwise, it's it's working pretty well. The only thing, the only the only downside um, right now is that it for for every time you load um, the view or the results, uh, it will uh, run a Sparkle query. So you could add yeah, there, there are some ways to add cache in between to save uh, on Sparkle queries, but this is a uh, this is something you should know uh, in advance. So. Yeah, I seem I seem to be losing Stefan, or maybe it's my. Uh, I'm. Uh, what do you mean? I'm still here. Can you hear me? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's my my uh, connection. So did that answer the question? I'm not sure if. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the Sparkle query itself is built through the field you add to the view. The Sparkle query is built on the fly by views. So normally views is, I mean, views comfort zone typically is SQL queries. Yeah. Um, but um, Sparkle views will rewrite that and will instead write um, Sparkle queries instead of SQL queries. Cool. Thanks very much. Hey, Stefan and David, I think on that, just on that topic, the Sparkle queries, if I remember correctly, Lynn Clark had some really in-depth YouTube videos about how to use mm -hmm. that Sparkle Views module. Yeah. Do, there, do you is some, still... okay. there is some documentation out there. I'm not sure um, um, how updated it is, um, but there is at least one video that should show that. Can you sh uh, share that URL with the? Uh, uh, not not right now, but. Uh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll find it for you. Yeah. Okay. I want to. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I just want to uh, uh, move on unless there's another question. The, the video is actually on the Spark Reviews uh, project page, which I which I linked from one of my slides. So there's um there are um screencast links from there. Great, great, thanks.
All right. Thank you so much uh, uh, for updating us on, uh, on what's going on. Um, let me just ask a, a final question, and because we're going to get this in the summer when people are uh, coming into our Drupal Lab, which is our next topic, is that uh, half the people are going to be there trying to explore whether they should move to Drupal. And uh, uh, so I'd like to be able to say, well, you know, Drupal happens to be one of the stronger uh, semantically enabled content management systems. Do you think that's a that's a statement I can make? Um, yeah, I believe so, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure. Yeah, compared to the major CMSs like WordPress and Chrome now, um, Type 3, it's, uh, it's way ahead, yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Good to hear. Um, and thanks again, uh, Stefan. Um, I just want to, we have a couple minutes, and I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we have uh, a full day of, uh, of Drupal. We call it a Drupal camp, but the agencies prefer us to call it a Drupal lab uh, because they're paying for travel and they don't want to send people to camp, I guess. So, uh, uh, and I hope uh, that the people on the phone who are coming to the summer meeting will come, uh, uh, come to this uh, the day before the meeting formally opens. Um, and I'm showing you we've, we've got a very good uh, agenda. We have half a day of some really uh, great uh, presentations and discussions, um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll have lunch, and then uh, uh, we'll have a, uh, an afternoon keynote uh, with, with Angie uh, Byron. I think, I don't know, Angie, you're still, are you still here on the call? Yeah, I am. Hi. Cool. Hi, All right. Hi. And uh, so, uh, and uh, before lunch, we're going to have uh, one of the uh, 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 Drush uh, maintainers is going to be uh, talking about what's new in Drush and, and introducing people who, who aren't using Drush to Drush. And so, uh, and then we'll we'll end up with uh, uh, some boss uh, to end the day, and then uh, go out for beer. Um, and as I was saying at the beginning, uh, we have. Uh, uh, NASA has released uh, 80 travel approval for the meeting, so uh, we are looking to have a, a fairly full meeting. Um, and uh, and I think NOAA is going to be well represented, um, and um, and hopefully uh, we're we're also reaching out to the uh, folks in the local uh, research triangle Drupal uh, users group uh, and inviting them to come in as well. Um, Angie, do you want to say something about what you'll be talking about? Yeah, so what I'm going to be speaking about is the uh, the new version of Drupal that we're currently actively working on, Drupal 8. Uh, so everything Stefan just talked about is, is what you can use right now um, out in the wild there for Drupal 7. Um, I'm talking about the next version of Drupal, which will probably be coming out either later this year or quarter one of next year. Um, just to kind of give a preview of what's coming up and what's interesting. Um, if you guys have suggestions on, um, you know, any parts of that that would be particularly interesting to you, I know I heard a lot about web services. Um, I heard a lot about um, semantic web and things like that. But if there's other aspects of that that you'd like me to touch on, um, I'd love to drill in on that with you. But otherwise, it's going to be kind of an overview of what's coming just so you can kind of uh, you know, prepare yourselves for that. And then I'll also touch on, you know, a lot of the stuff in Drupal 8 is stuff you can use right now even. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about, you know, where the, some of those things overlap. So if some of this stuff looks really cool, you know, you can use it in your existing Drupal 7 sites right now for the most part. So, um, so that's what I'll be doing is just kind of giving an overview of everything that, uh, that there is to, to look forward to. Excellent. All right. Well, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So, uh, uh, any uh, suggestions for Angie? Special request? Angie, I would love to hear more just about the uh, the configuration management aspect of Drupal 8 and sure. you know, how that will yeah differ from features, uh, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> Um, and then I'll also, I mean, I don't know too much about <laughs> about this, but it sounds like they're using YAML a lot to do that. So yeah, that would, I would love to hear more about that. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yep. There's actually a lot of YAML in Drupal 8. And um, yeah, I'll get into the configuration system. If you're um, familiar with struggling a lot with features module, it should hopefully come as very welcome news for you. Uh, <laughs> that, that'll be a, a good, uh, good, good topic. All right. Uh, I think we're just over time now. Any last uh, uh, comments or comments. questions? Well, thanks everyone for your time, and uh, we will next see you in uh, Chapel Hill. Yeah, looking forward to meeting you all. Thanks, okay, Andy. Ciao. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Stefan. Sure.